Um, Karibuni, my name is Leila Liebertrau. Um, I'm the project lead of the Route to Food Initiative. Um, I would be saying this in Swahili if uh, my Swahili teacher had done a very, very good job. Um, she is still working hard to get there. Um, I just want to thank you all for giving us this time um, this afternoon. Uh, we're looking forward to some interesting discussions. Um, this is the third episode of a three-part series on pesticides in Kenya. Um, and we really wanted to, we've had um, a webinar for the past two weeks, um, really looking at sort of some data that's come out of sampling studies that we've done um, in various counties, um, and we developed a fact sheet for that as a result, just to look at how pesticides are being used um, and on what crops. Um, and then uh, last week, we spent some time understanding from the Pest Control Product Board um, with some case examples from South Africa, how the registration, projects, pro, um, registration process works uh, in Kenya. Um, and we've explored a little bit also the double standard from uh, manufacturing companies um, in the EU um, and the double standard as regards to them selling pesticides that are not allowed for use in the EU, um, but are, um, are being used or exported to other countries in the world. So today's focus will be on what sort of solutions are there? Um, alternatives do we have um, to, to chemical pesticides? Um, and we've got a really interesting group of um, panelists with us today. Um, so we'll be joined by um, Silke, who is an ecotoxicologist um, and has done a lot of work in Kenya and on the continent on uh, chemical pesticides, um, a lot of work with smallholder farmers. Um, we are also um, joined by Emmanuel Atamba, who is the policy and research coordinator on the Route of Food Initiative and my very close colleague. Um, and then we are joined by Martin Kimani, who's a program officer at Kenya Organic Agriculture Network, Karibu Martin, um, as well as also to the lovely Sylvia Correa, who um, is the founder of Sylvia's Basket, but also um, an organic farmer in Kiambu County. Kiambu, Sylvia? Yes, in Kiambu County. Um, and so, I will invite Silke just to share a few slides with us and sort of set the foundation, set, set the scene for today's conversation. Silke. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I forgot one thing. Sorry. Um, I'm getting too comfortable now. Please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or to use the Q&A function and raise your questions there. Um, alternatively, you can raise your digital hand um, and uh, we will, and I'll be able to come back around um, to, to, to offer you an opportunity to speak. Um, we're going to go through each of the presentations first. Um, so it's 15 minutes each, and then we'll have an, a chance for Q&A. Okay, now Silke, please go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Laila, for the nice introduction. Um, right, so today we're talking about alternatives and solutions. And um, I just want to uh, give you like some shots from the first webinar in, in case you haven't been there to really reflect on the on the issue that, that we need a change in pesticide use. Um, because there are a couple of issues around that. Um, so it's not only about the registered pesticides in Kenya, it's also about the pesticide use in Kenya. We looked at two counties and we looked at the, um, in light red, you can see the HHPs, which is called highly hazardous pesticides. So these are very toxic and um, they fall under um, a new drive on phasing out these highly hazardous pesticides worldwide. Um, and Kenya is also part of it. So we found out that basically um, almost 75% of all the type of pesticides being used in these two counties actually uh, belong to this group of highly hazardous pesticides. 
And also the frequency of use shows more or less the same picture, even worse, like 75% of all the pesticides applied, like the, the application itself, uh, was actually the application of highly hazardous pesticides. Um, and then we, we looked at the use of these toxic pesticides on different crops, because this is now very important for this session today. Um, on which crops should we focus maybe on alternatives and solutions. And we found out that those crops Kenyans eat most of the time, like the maize, the tomatoes, the sukuma wiki and the cabbage actually requires or, or um, uses most of these highly hazardous pesticides, as you can see here in this figure. The dark red are the highly hazardous pesticides, the light red are the, the others which are not so toxic. So it's not about facing out all the pesticides, it's really facing or, or like um, looking at it critically in terms of um, how do we find solutions for these highly hazardous pesticides to, to um, make sure that farmers are not using them. Also in the first webinar, we also reflected already that these highly hazardous pesticides are in use, but farmers very often don't use um, protection equipment, they can't follow the mitigation measures, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's not very surprising that we then found when we looked at the food residues, we found a couple of these highly hazardous pesticides on tomatoes on the left side and sukuma wiki on the right side. So um, 18 different ones on tomatoes and 10 different ones on sukuma wiki. So I think this reflects quite easily um, that there needs to be a change and that we that we really need to find a way of controlling the pesticide use in a better way and reducing the pesticide use and finding solutions. Um, and I really like this phrase. Um, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So most of the time, and I really would like to focus or to highlight the, the need for a holistic approach. We can't change a conventional farm to an organic farm. We don't even maybe want that. As I, as I said already, we would like to, to um, reflect more critically on the use of these highly hazardous pesticides. And very often the argument is there that uh, Kenya has certain pests and we need these very toxic pesticides to control the pest. Um, but I think if there's a holistic approach where we look holistically at the environment, and the farm system is an environment, it's an ecosystem. And most of the time, or very often, the soil is quite degraded, the soil fertility might be not as high as it could be. So that means the plant is already very sick or can't get very healthy. And the same with us, if we are not healthy, if we're not living a healthy lifestyle, then we might get much more sick by bacteria and viruses than a person who has a, a healthy lifestyle. So it's really important to look at the holistic picture of the ecosystem farming agriculture um, in terms of making it actually possible to move from uh, uncontrolled use of highly hazardous pesticides without sometimes even know what type of pesticide it is with wrong application rates, et cetera, to a more controlled way and a more ecological way. Um, and this holistic approach then would reflect on, we should probably first look at the soil and how do we, do, how do we make sure that the soil is, is coming back to, to a healthy soil and to a diverse soil. And we need that soil as the base for a healthy plant. Um, also good water management is part of this um, in terms of being able to move away from pesticides. Because if a plant is not getting enough water, then the plant is stressed and the pest can attack much in a much better way. These type of things are not necessarily reflected in the integrated pest management, but they are very much reflected in agroecology in permaculture and all these other um, type of aspects. Biodiversity is also quite a, a, a big one um, to make sure that you have lots of different plants on the plot. If you only have mice, maize, the pest um, damage can be much higher than if you have a mixed farming system. Um, economically, I think we should also look at the, um, the value of good soil. How much is actually good soil um, worthwhile in terms of money and versus costs of pesticide use? We only look at the benefits or it's most of the time it's communicated in a, in a type of benefit 
of pesticide use, but it also has costs related to health. We can then move to social aspects. How do we actually incorporate the costs for pesticides on our health, on the farmer's health, on the sprayer's health? So all these type of things need to be considered in a holistic approach. And I think we will, we will hear some really, really nice examples um, from the next two speakers, how we can actually move towards a more controlled, a more sustainable, or even more regenerative um, way of um, farming, especially for these uh, crops Kenyan use most, tomatoes, maize, cabbage, all these crops who are currently need a lot of highly hazardous pesticides. Thank you. Over to okay. you, Laila. Thank you very much, Silke, for that introduction. Um, Emmanuel, I'm just going to move straight on to you, please. Um, just to introduce your topic, um, and you've got 15 minutes. Guys, so like I said, um, the video recording of this webinar will be made available um, in an email that is sent out tomorrow. If you do want the slides specifically, I would, I would ask that you please email us um, so that we can, circulate, we can circulate the slides and I'll drop the email address. You can reach out to us on the chat. Um, Emmanuel, are you ready? Yes, thanks, Leila. You can be able to follow my screen clearly. We can. It's a bit, yeah, it's got okay. the presenter view, though. Do you want to show it without the presenter view? How do I do that? <laughs> uh, go, sorry, just go close the file. Because okay. we can see, uh, we can see is the, yeah, just go from current slide. Oh, no. Let me, let me send it, then we can start with the next presentation as I share it with you so that you can... Okay, it. okay, yeah. okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Martin, that. yeah. that's okay, don't worry. It's just a setting thing, actually. Can I take you back to your screen? We've got, it's okay, we've got one minute. Yeah, yeah. Let me take you okay. back. There was just a checkbox that was checked. That I'll share my screen now. Okay. Yeah, and then I'll show you. Okay. So I can see your screen. You can yes. see there um, in that in the navigation on the right, it says there's okay. a tick box. Go keep going along. There you can see. You present that. Okay. Okay. Take that off and now okay. go from beginning. Okay. Super. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thanks. This is, this is also a lesson in how to present, everybody. We learn, how to use we, PowerPoint. We learn every day. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. So okay, good, afternoon. Okay. good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Atamba Oriedo, and I'm a research and policy analyst at uh, Root to Food. Um, trained in agriculture, I think it's important, it's important nowadays that uh, we uh, put it uh, clear. Also, I'm uh, trained in agriculture. I'm also a farmer myself. And I uh, would just like to talk a bit about legislation and the budget allocation, and especially looking at uh, issues of pesticide uh, management of pesticide uh, use and, of course, pest control in general. And uh, yeah, I would like to start with something funny. Uh, you know, now we're having online classes and everything else. And uh, there's this question that keeps coming up every time, you know, when people are engaging and sharing screens online. The question is always are we on the same page? So, and I would like to just pose a few questions as I start. And uh, the first question is, what does the Kenyan consumer want? What does the Kenyan consumer want? And uh, what are the needs of the Kenyan farmer, the small scale farmer who produces 80% of the food that we eat? And what are the current environmental issues that we are dealing with? Yeah. Um, I don't want to give answers. I know the answers are coming as you, as, you, know, as you look at the questions, as you, 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 know, you hear the questions coming up, the answers are coming to your mind. So what does the Kenyan consumer want? What are the needs of the Kenyan farmer? Of course, when you're talking about the Kenyan farmer, putting it into the Kenyan context, most of our farmers are small scale and they produce most of the food that we eat. And then what are the current environmental issues that we are dealing with? And then on the flip side, we are looking at what are we doing? So what are our agricultural policies and the legal frameworks? 
and now also looking at the pesticide uh, use. And where are we putting our resources? What systems are we funding? Then I'll ask the same question again, are we on the same page? Perhaps not, because the things, you know, the, the, the three things above do not align with the three things below. What we want versus what we are doing, um, especially when it comes to issue of pesticide use, uh, is, 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 not, is not aligned. And that is, that is where the issue is. So I'll uh, look, a bit of uh, look at a bit of details. Uh, this is a 15 minute presentation. We cannot really go into the depth of everything, but I'll just um, take you through, for example, some of the key issues in terms of the current legislation on pesticides. And uh, as we discuss this, let us also remember that we have a process uh, ongoing uh, by the PCPB to review the you know, Pest Control Products Act and uh, some of the regulations that come with that. So that is also in the pipeline. So even, even when we are discussing this, you know, it's, it also takes uh, into account some of the developments that are going on, uh, which is very important because uh, we definitely need to fix um, some, of the, some of the legal, I mean, legislation, gaps in legislation when it comes to pesticide control. So one of the key things as we talk about legislation and, and, and generally how we manage pesticides in the country is this big debate about you know, uh, whether we go risk-based or hazard-based. And uh, to just you know, put it very simply, a risk-based system when you're looking at pesticides, uh, you know, your, a risk is you know, you're calculating the hazard, the inherent uh, you know, um, toxicity or ability of the product to cause harm, and then the level of exposure. So when you are using a risk-based system, you calculate these two factors to tell you the risk of this, uh, of this product when it's in the market. So therefore the risk-based um, um, you know, regime or approach assumes that there are mitigation measures in place and therefore allows some of the highly toxic products into the market because there is assumption that some of those very strict you know, uh, procedures uh, or measures that are supposed to be taken when using a highly toxic product are put in place. A hazard-based uh, approach is where now you're looking at products only based on their inherent toxicity and you do not necessarily make assumption now on mitigation. So here you're saying, okay, so this product is known to be carcinogenic and or highly carcinogenic for that matter and therefore we are not allowing it into the market. The other one you're saying, okay, so it's highly carcinogenic but our farmers are the best. They are using protective gear. They are observing uh, pre-harvest uh, window and they are making sure that the product has taken enough time before harvesting, for example, if it's uh, for leafy vegetables or tomatoes, you know, all the vegetables that we grow, horticultural productions that we, we do in this country. So, so you assume that those practices that go with the high level, or, you know, the, 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 the high risk level that you know, are taken, are taken care of. And, 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 and now, I now want to also just, you know, at least, uh, you know, get you excited by now giving you the Kenyan context. So comparing the two, the two approaches, one assumes that there are measures in place, that the system allows for, uh, for measures to be in place that, uh, you know, for example, now how the people use these uh, products, uh, that the system can be able to, you know, work with some of the, even some of the most toxic products. And, and speaking about this, remember we, you know, we are having this discussion, and then, uh, you know, uh, Kenya is one of the countries that has, uh, uh, you know, um, a wide range of pesticide products, and uh, we have never had that conversation where we are talking about removing some of the products based on, on the toxicity, because there is this assumption that you know the products are being used in a safe way or something like that. But just be the judge. I'm just going to give you a few photos that I have taken myself from farms here in Kenya. And you be the judge whether we have mitigation measures to deal with some of the most toxic products or not. Because this, this, is, the, this is the thinking that forms now, for example, now that, you know, the, even, even the legislations that we put in place and the measures to regulate and enforce, this is the thinking that, that, that guides all that. Which regime are we using? How are we looking at pesticides? Yeah. Uh, so this is how we handle pesticides in this country. This is a photo I took myself. Um, this is how we, we mix uh, pesticide products with bare hands. This is how we spray them. Of course, I had to hide the face of the farmer uh, because it's not the face of the farmer that is the problem or this particular farmer. We are just trying to show the system as, as it is. This, this is how we spread. 
If you are good in looking at daylight and telling the time, you can easily tell that this is almost midday and the sun is out and this farmer is praying without a mask. Yeah. This is how we dispose containers, pesticide containers. Some will throw them. Um, some of the containers will get themselves into you know, the drainage system, the waterways. And uh, some, some of us also interestingly are banning some of these pesticide products just in the farm. Yeah. So I want you to be the judge to say, okay, so which, 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 which regime is best? Um, so, and, and it's very important that as we, even as we work on legislation on anything, uh, be it education, um, uh, be it pesticides, as we are looking, everything should be based on what is our context, what is the Kenyan context. Yeah, so this is the Kenyan context, and this is what we should look at when deciding which is the regime that we are using to regulate our pesticides, how are we looking at these products. Of course, there are a lot of other issues when it comes to legislations. Um, one of the key things is that consumers are not represented in the board composition of the Pest Control Products Board. Why is this very important? Why am I saying consumers? This word consumers is a word that we should get used to using a lot. Um, the Kenyan economy is changing a lot uh, in the recent days. A lot of us are moving from the original you know, farming of production. Initially, some years back, I assume, even before I was, before I was born, you know, it was easy to say farmers and it would represent everyone. It's important that we recognize that today, farmers does not, the word farmers does not represent all Kenyans. That there are a lot of Kenyans who are not interacting with farming as it were before. Uh, but a lot of everyone, I mean, not even, I mean, every one of us is engaging in consumption. So why is it important that consumers are represented in this? Uh, because when you talk about farmers, it's very different now to classify, you know, are you talking about small scale farmers? Are you talking about farmers who are growing for export? Are you talking about, but when you talk about consumers, it's all of us. So we need to be able to, consumers need to be able to be represented in this, uh, in this decision making processes and, and in the composition of the, the, the PCPB board. So this is missing both in the, in the current and in the, in the proposed and in the current, in the current legal framework. And, then, and there are no pro clear provisions for withdrawing harmful pesticides. There is no continued review for products as, as soon as they are registered into the market. When it comes to public health, there are no clear guidelines within the legal frameworks for pesticide control on public education um, and basically awareness on how, you know, on some of the issues that come with uh, pesticide use and how to handle them. You know, even simple things, for example, like accident management and things like that. Yes, it's written. It's written on the label, but you know, people are not are not aware. For example, if someone gobbles up a bottle of pesticides, you know, where do they go to? Do we even have those mechanisms in place to, 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 to save lives in case of accidents with pesticides? Uh, there is no clear guideline on monitoring of pesticide residues in food and the environment. Um, up to now, uh, of course, different organizations have different responsibilities in that, but there's really no clear mandate uh, when it comes uh, when it comes to um, uh, to pesticide residue monitoring, and there are no regulations for that um, as of now. There is no responsibility, clear responsibility for agro dealers in educating farmers. When a farmer comes to the counter and they want to buy a product that requires protective gear to apply, what is the responsibility of this agro dealer to tell the farmer that if you do not have protective gear, I'm not going to give you this product because it requires you to have protective gear. The same way we do it, for example, for human medicine, you know, there's medicine that you cannot sell to children. Yeah, they have to be accompanied by an adult or something like that. You have to go with a prescription. There's prescription medicine. You have to go with a, with a prescription for you to be given that, uh, that medication. So there, there are a lot of gaps. I will not go into details. Um, so also there's uh, really a gap in terms of post-registration control. After a product has been registered, you know, are we getting data from, for example, now the PCPB is just able to get data from the companies? Um, are they able to report adverse effects? Are there, you know, is there a legal requirement for them to do that? Is there a legal requirement uh, for companies to report their import and sales data? Because it's very important that the data that, you know, the regulator has can be able to inform on, on, on decisions and inform on, uh, on what they're doing. Because if the regulator does not know how much product was imported into the country, where the regulator is operating, then clearly there is a gap there because even when you start talking about quantities, when you start talking about even sales, you know where are these products going? Pesticide products that are going to Kirinyaga and pesticide products that are going to Nakuru, you know we need to have that data to look at so that we can see. Okay, so why is uh, a product that has only been registered for flowers, for example, 
being sold in a region where there are no flowers? How will we know you would not have sales data? So these are these are things that are very practical and you know they need to be there so that you, you are able to, even the regulator is able to have an easy task of, of, of regulating and, and, and following up and, and, and knowing what is happening. Yeah, and there are no clear legal guidelines on compensating victims of exposure to harmful compounds in pest control products. Again, you know, pesticides are technologies. Yeah, technologies are bound to fail. Technologies can cause harm. I use the example of an iron box. The same iron box that straightened your shirt yesterday can burn your shirt today. So what happens in that situation? Yeah, what happens in that situation? Is there a mechanism for compensation for victims of exposure to harmful compounds? Yeah, and there are, therefore also the, the issue of, uh, you know, protection of non-target areas is very key. So for example, schools, you know, there's no guidelines to say how many meters from the school are you not supposed to spray, yeah? Um, you know, public areas, markets, and all that. If someone has a farm next to a market, yeah, uh, you know, there's no guideline that, you know, you shouldn't maybe spray because the wind is blowing towards the market and people are likely to inhale that product and it's likely to cause harm. And again, look at this vis-a-vis -vis now the, the, the whole discussion about whether we should go risk-based or hazard-based and, and just look at what is happening in our environment. And then there's, there's really no guideline on recalling and, uh, and uh, you know, disposing obsolete pest control products. This is an area that a lot of people are not talking about. We are only talking about pesticides that are applied in the farm because that is what we see. There is a lot of discussion around how much pesticide is dumped because maybe they over imported you know, the sales team and 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 the and the, and the, you know and, and 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 the team that does the procurement or something like that within the, within this company that sells the pesticides. Maybe there's no clear communication, someone over imports. And these pesticides have a very, very short, most of the pesticide products have a very short um, shelf life, and uh, some of them would expire. So what happens to pesticide products that expire in the shelves? How are they disposed? You know, what quantities is actually being thrown out even before it goes to the farm? Yeah, so those are those are things that are, are not even included in the in the legislation, both the current legislation and the proposed legislation. So these are clear gaps that need to um, that to be flagged and, and, and looked at. And finally, um, just to touch now also on uh, on budget allocation, which is very important, because some of the things that we talk about, some of the things that we want done, require financing. Yeah. So the table that I've just uh, projected shows the, the, the allocation to the Pest Control Products Board, which is the institution that is mandated um, uh, to deal with the issues to do with pesticides, uh, both in terms of, you know, also the, the, you know, the, the registration, the monitoring, and uh, also research basically on pesticides. Yeah? So, so this institution, if you look at the, the budget requirement uh, for this uh, financial year was 396. Uh, million and they got uh, they got 179. So you're looking at that uh, you're looking at that deviation there, which is very 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 significant. Yeah, sorry, 284 and uh, 200 and uh, 203. So there's a division of 50 55 million. Yeah. So if you look at the budgetary allocation in terms of the share of the entire arid sector, which includes a lot of things beyond even agriculture. Uh, sector as it were, if you look at it um, uh, as a sector in, in terms of agriculture, the, the budget allocation is only 0.3%. Yet, if you look at the importance of, of, of what the, 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 the PCPP is doing, is far beyond that. And the issues we are talking about, issues of safety, issues of monitoring, yeah, uh, there's uh, a lot of requirement for that. But I'll just focus on the deviation. There's already a deviation of 55 million from the requirement now to the allocation. And, and what does that mean? Um, what is at stake then, uh, if you're looking at that deviation? There are some of the things that will have definitely to be dropped because if, if, if the institution is requiring this much and, and, and the funding is, is, uh, is less. So some of the things that uh, would be definitely at stake uh, would be the completion of the laboratory, which is, I think, uh, which is ongoing. Um, and, and if you don't have a laboratory for, for, you know, for testing residues and, and the analytical um, components of pesticide products, for example, so if we do not have that capacity within the country, you know, what does that mean definitely? It means that we, we are more exposed um, and, and, and we will not be able to, the institution will not be able to carry out its, its regulatory mandate uh, effectively. Of course, there is need for capacity to monitor, monitor pesticide use and enforce regulations. We have all heard about pesticides coming from different countries and all that. If the institution that is mandated to, uh, to do that is not well-funded, then uh, 
how is it possible to put in place, for example, you know, the, 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 the manpower that is required? And by manpower, I also mean, uh, it doesn't mean uh, men only, uh, but uh, of course, in economic sense, uh, that is required to be able to, uh, to, 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 to enforce some of these regulations. So the capacity of the institution to also educate the public on health and environmental safety issues resulting from pesticide use is reduced. Uh, the finalization of the act and legislation review process you know, could also be affected, or also the ability of the institution to support alternatives uh, to chemical pesticides, uh, you know, through research and local development of biopesticides, uh, which is something that also needs to, you know, is linked to the, to the you know, availability of laboratory for testing uh, could also be affected. So, so as we think about pesticides in general, and uh, we think about the legislation and landscape and also the, uh, the budget allocation, these are some of the, some of the key issues. And um, I think it's very practical if you, if you look at it and you go back to the same question, if we are still on the same page, I don't know if we are still on the same page, that uh, we are clear on what we want. We know what we need. We know what the Kenyan consumer deserves. The Kenyan consumer deserves safe food and all that. Uh, we know the needs of the Kenyan farmer. It doesn't matter whether, you know, it's not about organic versus conventional and all that. I think at the end of the day, we need to agree on some set of standards and, and procedures of producing our own food and regulating our own food. Yeah. So if the farmers, for example, decide that you know we can only use pesticides to uh, to to yeah to uh, to grow our food, then uh, it's upon us to make sure that uh, the reg it's upon the regulator and the government in general to make sure that even through that practice, consumers are safe. And I would like, as I end, I'd like you to, um, you know, to start ingraining that term very clearly. Uh, I mean, in your minds, in our minds, it's very important that all of us start to um, uh, to associate ourselves with this term because that is where all of us meet. You can be a producer, you can be doing something else in a totally different sector, but all of us are meeting at consumption, and all of us want to consume safe food, and it's upon all of us to uh, to really uh, champion for that. Uh, thank you, Leila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, so to really extend what Emmanuel has started to suggest is whether or not we are on the same page, um, Martin is going to talk to us a little bit around whether we really do need pesticides um, and what some of the solutions or alternatives might be to the use of um, synthetic pesticides. So Martin, uh, you should be able to share your presentation. Can you see my presentation? It's just opening. It's open. Perfect. Okay. okay. So, um, my so name you've is got Martin. 15 minutes, Martin. <laughs> yeah, I should have told that to Atamba. <laughs> I was trying to. Okay, okay go yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my name is Martin Joroge. Um, I'm the programs officer at the Kenya Organic Agriculture Network. Our main role is to promote organic production in Kenya, as well as link farmers to markets. So the question is, do we really need uh, pesticides or synthetic pesticides in Kenya? Um, yeah. So, so okay. Uh, the current reality in Kenya is that we don't really equate um, food security to food safety in as much as uh, the, the operational definition of food security is a situation where all the people at all times have physical, social, economic access to safe, sufficient, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and uh, food preferences for an active life. But how we define it is not really the same way. We just uh, look at it from the perspective of let's feed our people first, then we can focus on food safety. And that's why we find uh, so much false uh, between the cracks when it comes to issues of food uh, food safety. You see, like, uh, how we got mercury, lead, and sugar in our... And we never seen... It, this matter has never been quite resolved. You also find that uh, there's a lot of safety concerns when it comes to other food items, like uh, moya rice. This is just... Uh, these are just a few articles that appear on our dailies when it comes to issues dealing with food safety as well as issues dealing with how we conduct our food affairs in Kenya. And we find that, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit that's uh, actually lacking and we need to do something about it. So uh, what we need to understand when it comes to 
pesticides and uh, synthetic pesticides in Kenya and the whole farming affair is that it's really dominated by meats when you when you encounter farmers and when you're talking with farmers first thing is most of the farmers that have come to interact with they relate being modern as being farmers who rely on pesticides that's why you find that uh, most uh, pesticide companies they control the narrative in farming you you you'll find them uh, they are everywhere they are very hard, they are really hard to miss if if uh, you 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 have the vernacular if you access the vernacular radio stations every morning there has to be an advert about some uh, some chemical or some uh, some pesticide or some fertilizer or something of the sort and uh, yeah they do have really extensive marketing and uh, human resource budgets that's why they are able to have posters in all agrovets they also have they also have extension service staff on hand to assist farmers how they assist them uh, yeah you know once you go to an agrovet they can direct a particular company extension staff to your farm who are able to advise you on what to do on what to grow and which it's actually which inputs to use on your farm this is something that i have come across routinely as i go to to talk with farmers and also to to just uh, in my studies so uh, this is a farmer she's called uh, lucy and she's from moranga she used to be a, a conventional farmer a while back and uh, this is what she told me not not more than a month ago that before she she started going to organic she thought chemicals were the only modern way of farming and uh, you find that why not the farmers have really they are, they are, they are they are confronted with really attractive packaging find that there are so many regimes uh, to control each and every form of pest disease weed and everything so how can farmers really resist such an attractive packaging such a professional way of marketing the the things yeah, and we've been taught to rely on whatever looks the best so um yeah just uh kiswahili say that goes chema cha juza kibaya cha jitembeza a good thing sells itself a bad thing must be advertised we never really used to survive using uh, pesticides but nowadays they are the mainstream when it comes to farming if you don't use pesticides you are not really a modern farmer and uh, the thing is this on the other side some lesser known alternatives do exist which are really really effective something like ipm integrated uh, pest management regenerative agroecological and organic practices they have been proven to work much much more effectively when it comes to pest and disease control and they are more sustainable in the long run and uh, the they actually help the farmers mitigate some of the more extreme forms of pest and uh, disease incidences on their farm and in a way once you promote alternative to synthetic pesticides you are demo democratizing food production in Kenya and allowing farmers to rely more on the indigenous knowledge than on uh, commercially inclined entities we find that we are really losing a lot of our indigenous knowledge indigenous seed indigenous uh, aspects to our farming that considering that we are now more and more farmers are moving towards synthetic pesticides these synthetic pesticides also come with the accompanying inputs which include uh, seed they also include fertilizers and the farmers eventually they are not able to to work independently of such chemical or such uh, pesticides and such inputs that come with them so the other myth that i have come across is that farmers believe that to be profitable profit pesticides are essential why first thing we saw earlier there is that strong presence of agrochem companies in kenya uh, that narrative is pushed constantly by such uh, such such companies and you you find that farmers are not able to resist these things and also the kind of narrative that's pushed along is that 
pesticides are 100% effective, that is synthetic pesticides are 100% effective. Well, we know that is not always the case. We find that pesticides don't always work as advertised. Pests also develop resistance to pesticides. A new pest also, also emerge, um, which are the conventional means of controlling them are not present. We find that uh, the white flies, the fall armyworm, Tuta absoluta, late and uh, early and late blight, aphids and the like. And uh, we also find that not only do pests and diseases uh, occurrences happen, we also find climate change is a big is a big contributor to what we are seeing in the in the farming industry. The lack of uh, of production, the dip in production, and uh, there's also something else. Conventional farmers, these are farmers who use chemicals, they really need, they really have to produce more to realize the profits on their farm, which is also puts an added pressure on them. If they lose their, their economic threshold for absorbing that damage is quite low compared to other forms of farming. And uh, this is just something that, yeah, in the course of my, of my work, uh, this is in I used to think that I had to buy chemicals so that I can get profit on my farm. Farmers believe this. With the bombardment of uh, such narratives in their radio stations, in their in their peers, with their peers, and with agrovets, with extension service providers who are yeah. Who, are, who come from uh, from such things, it's really hard for them not to think otherwise. And things like, uh, I'm, I'm talking about agroecology right now, they have been shown to be far less, uh, they use far less inputs and are more productive. They are more holistic, as uh, Silke talked about. There's high, high abundance of pollinators and get higher fruiting rates. This is for, for, for farmers. And uh, they are less capital intensive. The farmer more or less ha produces their own inputs on farm and rely very, very little on external inputs. This can include the uh, pest and disease control inputs, can also include uh, soil fertility inputs. And uh, there's that cycle, uh, the, that, that, uh, the, the, the cycle is completed within the farm. And any external inputs, the farmer has to really think about it before they bring something into the farm. And uh, yeah, let's talk about organic. Organic farmers, they, they actually make more money and get preferential market access. There are fewer brokers, not to say there are no brokers, but there are fewer brokers when it comes to organic. And uh, essentially it's easier to export organic produce than conventionally grown produce. It takes more steps to, 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 to export conventionally grown produce than the same crop you want to export to as organic. And also in Kenya, it is much easier to be registered as a supplier of organic produce than as a conventional food supplier. It's actually much cheaper to supply supermarkets with organic produce than it is to supply the same supermarket with conventional produce. They are, they are more stringent measures you have to, and more expensive ones. So. Um, this is something that I encountered when uh, related to the issue of pollinators. We find that the use of uh, synthetic chemicals also it curtails the presence of pollinators on the farm. And a farmer actually confirmed this for me, said that uh, when they used to spray their mango and avocado trees, Fruiting used to take at least twice as long because uh, the bees did not want to go near his, his trees. Yeah. So the other myth, and maybe not the final myth, but uh, the, the other myth that's quite common when it comes to production systems and reliance on, on synthetic pesticides is that large scale farming is not possible without pesticides. This is a really strong one. And it's usually paired with the one that states that organic farming cannot feed the world or pesticides are necessary if you have to feed the world by 2050. One thing we need to note that 90% of global food production is uh, by smallholder farmers who own up to 2.5 acres, which, uh, which means you don't necessarily have to feed the world. 
through large scale means you need to focus on uh, small scale farmers. And uh, in Kenya, contextually, most of the food is grown by small scale farmers, at least 70% of the food in Kenya. And uh, we, we need to look at the, the, the term large scale, more of a red herring, um, and focus should actually be on smallholder production and uh, production intensification, as well as improving consumer purchasing power. Uh, this is something from Kipra, which says that uh, evidence shows that solving food security is from a production side while overlooking the purchasing side of people does not solve the food security problem with regard to accessibility of sufficient food by vulnerable groups. We still find malnourished people in the slums. Why? Because they are not able to purchase the food. So we need to look at food security more holistically, not just as a supply side issue and not just throwing out the narrative that we need to produce more food for everybody to be food secure, but also look at it that uh, there are also other things, not only from the production side that need to be handled for, the, for Kenya to be considered as a food secure state. And uh, the, thing, the also other thing is that smallholder farmers in Kenya are challenged more of, uh, from climate change, which reduces the, the amount of food produced. If you are able to make them more resilient just as agroecological systems are able to make farmers more stable and resilient and are able to weather out climate change and its attendant effects. It's been observed that when it comes to drought and flooding, conventional farmers underperform compared to other agroecologically inclined farmers. Why? It's the system. They still use the same pesticides. The, the farmers, Conventional farmers use the same pesticides, the same fertilizers, but they are not able to withstand. And as Dr. Silke said, you look at the soil, you look at soil fertility, you look at also uh, if, if, if you're not get, getting good nutrition, you're not able to withstand any infections or withstand infections to a certain degree. And um, Internationally or in other areas, uh, not, not in Kenya, large scale farming has been shown using agroecological systems were found to be more productive actually compared to conventional systems. And with improved uh, farm mechanizations, the productivity and cost was far lower than in similar conventional systems. While when you ditch use of pesticides and you, and you go towards more push and pull integrated pest management approaches, the long-term effects is actually quite lower. And uh, let's go back to the main question. Do we really need pesticides? We've seen agroecological farm diversity leads to greater farm yield. Farmers are able to control their destiny when it comes to inputs, when it comes to seed, which is also a very big issue. Majority of, uh, just a, I'm going to, to wind up right now. Uh, majority of the companies that control inputs also control control fertilizer, also control seed, they also control fertilizers, and they also control biotech. So it's like uh, farmers are being herded to add a logical conclusion of a few players controlling major market uh, domina dominance on uh, on on on. On, in farming. And the other thing is smallholder farmers, they earn more when they go organic. They get the better markets, they get better prices. They avoid uh, an increase in, uh, in brokers. And also farmers, they, uh, they become more resilient to climate shocks when they farm agroecologically. Due to the diversity, they might suffer the same pest and disease incidences, but because their farms are more diverse, they have multiple enterprises on the farm which will not suffer the same level of damage compared to other farms, conventional farms, which actually monocrop. And uh, the other externalities we need to think about when talking about pesticides, as Atamba has, uh, has been able to, to show is that, one, there's an added risk to farmers when it comes to uh, some of the impacts. There's that risk to consumers. And also, we also have the environmental health Pesticides do pollute the environment. You've seen those uh, photos of discarded pesticide bottles in, the, in, in, in water systems, in beaches, and they're also being burnt 
We are also experiencing colon link collapse disorder, although it's not as apparent here in Kenya, but from my sources in Baringo, it's still happening. And also these, uh, these uh, pesticides are also to, are able to leach inside our water sources or aquifers, and we, we find uh, reduced water qualities. And uh, the other thing is, pesticides- Martin, pesticides, sorry. Yeah, okay, 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 yeah, okay. It's the last thing, last, last thing. Pesticides are based on petrochemical industries and uh, yeah, the carbon footprint, toxic bioproducts, bioaccumulation of the pesticides in the environment. So yeah, the question is, if we do have alternatives, we really need these pesticides. Yeah, yeah, back to you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Sylvia now to please. Um, Sylvia is an example, a shining example of an empowered woman who is uh, showing that um, that alternatives are available and are working. Um, and she's in a very unique position to be able to speak to this from a producer and a consumer perspective because she um, she has a startup organic business in Nairobi. Um, so handing over to you, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Leila. Um, please help me with my slides, Leila. Oh, yes, yeah, we did speak about that, sorry. So hi everyone, um, as my slides are coming up, as Leila has said, I'm Sylvia Kuria, a small scale organic farmer from a small village um, in Limuru called uh, Ndeya, we're in Kiambu County. And apart from the farm, uh, we also have a small organic shop where we sell our produce from our farm and not just from our farm, uh, but we also support uh, small scale organic farmers from all over the country to be able to access markets. And we don't work on our own. We also work with Koan. So uh, Martin is a great partner in the work that we do. And we are able to actually work together to make sure that the small scale organic farmers that actually go through the training uh, with Martin are actually able to access their market. So today I'm going to talk about alternative production. And I'm just you know, basically just sharing my story and just giving an overview of what we've been doing. So I'm asking, is agroecology the answer? Are we able to actually, you know, um, you know, uh, grow food agroecologically? So do you know how safe your food is? I don't want to go through this slide in detail because I find that many of my slides are very similar to what Martin had already gone through. And these are just small um, excerpts I got from the newspaper and from different media houses that are actually talking about how we have a lot of uh, media awareness. And many Kenyans know that um, a lot of the food, unfortunately, that is being sold in the market or is found you know, in the local uh, dukas is actually not very safe for us. You know. In the first quote, you know, it was talking about, remember um, about the meat that was, um, um, was contaminated you know, with this um, sodium and it's actually a preservative. And it was very sad that you know, at what level have we gone to actually put such things in our food, you know, and you know, milk has got E. coli, um, it has acetoxins, and also when you talk about even the vegetables, you know, a few, maybe about six, eight weeks ago, you know, there was a big expose about the vegetables that we're eating. And I just wanted to keep asking ourselves, do you know how safe your food is? You actually take time and ask yourself, what's the source of the food I'm eating? Is it safe? Is it good for me? And we have the um, uh, like media expose. But I somehow feel that as Kenyans, you know, we just think about it for a very short time. And then soon after that, we forget about it, you know. And um, real quick, you know, just after the expose, you normally find like in our shop, you know, like one week after uh, um, um, like an expose, you find you're selling so many vegetables. And then now people forget about it and go about our business. Uh -huh, next slide. And then um, I'm not going to go into much detail because I just basically want to talk about agroecology and Martin has done it. I don't want to, uh, you know, like repeat, um, you know, what he shared with us. But when you talk about agroecology, um, in my slide, I was just thinking about, you know, like four different subtopics. When you think about the economic part of agroecology, like in terms of defining it, you know, it's making sure that you actually have, you know, like short supply chains, you know, from the farmer, you're able to get food from the farmer to the consumer and being able to, 
you know, have a diversity of vegetables that you can be able to sell. Like in this season, let me give an example, a planted maize beans, a planted sorghum, a planted millet, a planted sunflower. So the range have been really, really terrible. So if my maize doesn't do well, I know I'm actually going to be able to have something from the sorghum and millet or uh, from the sunflower and I'll be able to sell. When you think about the um, political part of agroecology, what are you doing as a consumer? Are you involved? Are you working with the local leaders? Are you able to, um, you know, work in the local policy making to make sure that you actually have a voice talk about, you know, safe food and these practices that are working for us? Environmentally, they're thinking about um, the resilience of our environment. You know, like, are we thinking about our carbon footprint? Are we thinking about good soil? You know, Dr. Silke talks about it, you know, previously about soil. Soil is the basis of everything. If you're not working on your soil, then what are we doing really? If you're not thinking about, you know, like how resilient your crops are, Martin has gone through, you know, in quite detail. Are your crops resilient to pests diseases? Are they resilient to the climate change? And what part are you playing in reducing the climate change? One of the factors about um, uh, the environmental part of agroecology, which I want to mention really quickly, is agroforestry. Are you planting trees? I know the season this year has not been very good, but are you planting trees? I have two farms, and on both farms in the last um, three years, we planted more than 3,000 trees just to be able to ensure that you know we are creating a microclimate on the farm and to make the farm more sustainable. And then finally, when you talk about the social cultural parts of agroecology, you know, you think about livelihood, you're thinking about diet. Is your diet good? Are you able to have a diversity of food to meet the, the nutritional needs of your family and your home? And are you able to involve women? You know, women and youth, to be honest, are the ones that um, are 80% of the small scale farmers. And we've been told that small scale farmers are the ones that are actually feeding the world. So I like that agroecology is actually dealing with these um, four major aspects of um, our livelihood. Next. So um, I'm just going to take you through, um, you know, very basic statistics. And um, I just wanted to just share about Africa. And I'm going to share two parts. One is about the countries uh, that have the largest areas uh, that are growing organically and the number of producers. So when you look at the first chart, um, uh, you can see Kenya comes in at number five. So we have Tunisia that is leading. Then we have Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And we think about the largest areas that are actually grown organically. Um, let me say something real quick here. We don't really have statistics that are talking specifically about agroecology. What we have is about organic, and these statistics are normally put together by an organization known as FIBO. You can read about it later, F-I-B-L, and they normally do these statistics about, I think, every three years, if I'm not wrong. So we are dealing with uh, statistics from, you know, about uh, 2017. I think they were to do others in uh, maybe last year in 2020, but because of COVID, I mean, it's been a bit complex. And then these areas that are, have the, um, um, like, organic, you know, that are labeled organic, is basically just the areas that um, many times would be, you know, like growers, like farmers are growing organic food, but also this is like uh, the forest land and the land that is not really cultivated. And that's why you find like Tunisia, because a big part of Tunisia is desert, then, you know, it's somehow classified as organic because no one is really tilling or working on the land. And then when you go uh, to the largest number of organic producers, Uganda is leading, you know, and Kenya comes in at a number four. And um, I don't know if uh, you guys know, but recently Uganda, I think in the last, I think four or five months, like Uganda actually were able to pass the organic, national organic policy, which is wonderful. Kenya, I know we have our paper, um, our draft policy at the Ministry of Agriculture. I'm not sure how far that has gone, but at least we've taken some steps to move towards that. Um, so in Kenya, we have about 50,000 organic growers. So that's encouraging, you can grow, but yeah, basically we are moving. Mm -hmm. Next. So I want to take us through the sustainability of organic, you know, and sustainable farming and agroecology, all these terminologies. And you're asking ourselves is that um, can agroecology, can organic, can sustainable farming really feed the world? Of course, I would say yes, but I want us to look quickly at this uh, chart of mine. So I basically have two flowers two very beautiful flowers. One is the conventional flower and the other one is the organic flower. And um, when you look at the flowers and you just look at how sustainable they are, when you look at the petals, look at the petals with me for a minute. 
you know, which, which flower looks more sustainable? You know, in my opinion, the organic one looks more sustainable because when you think about the yield, I know everyone is going to see the conventional flower has got higher yields than organic, which is true. But then this is not always accurate in the long term because what happens with the conventional farmers, and you can talk to most of the conventional farmers, they will say that the yields they're getting now is not what they were getting in the last 5, 20, 15, 20 years. You know, the yields has, you know, been decreasing over time, but you find in conventional farming, for the past five years of growing your food, you'll find that the yield is, not, is going to be generally high. But then when you come to the sixth, seventh, eighth year, you're going to find that your yield is actually going to be reducing because remember, you don't have much of biodiversity. Remember that you're not really working uh, very well with um, ecosystem services, which is like the soil and the beneficial um, microorganisms and the, the beneficial insects like the bees you'll find those ones will keep producing, which means that your yield is not going to be very high coming in from the sixth or seventh year. But then when you look at the organic flower, it's more sustainable because it is quite equal. You know, when you talk about the yield is high, and then when you talk about also the profitability, you find that organic farming or sustainable or agroecological farming is actually more sustainable in the long term because you're taking care of the soil, you're taking care of biodiversity, which means if you don't get a good crop of one per, uh, um, um, like a one crop able to sell something else. So you're not really dealing with monoculture, you're not dealing with monocropping, but basically growing a diverse, you know, um, array of vegetables and fruits. And so your profit, of course, is going to shoot high. And then we talk about the ecosystem, it's actually working very well because you have all the good producers working for you. And when you talk about the nutritional quality, is also quite high and stabilized all through the production. And that little picture is actually a picture of a kitchen garden of one of my workers. I was very surprised that he actually, you know, decided to plant flowers right next to his Skumawiki. And, you know, this is a whole long lecture for another day. But why does he have flowers in Skumawiki? It's because the flowers actually attract one, pollinators, and they also attract the good predators that actually eat the aphids. So flowers attract wasps that eat aphids. So if you do know that, now you know that. So yeah, let's move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so who has the power? Who has the power? Is it the consumer? Is it the producer? You know, who actually, you know, um, will determine whether you're going to, you know, what you're going to grow, how you're going to grow? Who is more powerful? Is it the farmers in this case or is it the consumers? You know, and we had this debate when I was doing my course in um, organic leadership course. And we actually concluded that the consumer is actually for sovereign. You know, when you talk about consumer sovereignty, this is where the consumer, um, like in my notes, it says that it has some controlling power over goods that are produced. But in my opinion, when you say some controlling power, it's actually not very small, but it's quite big. When you think about the middlemen, let me give an example of the middlemen who actually come to our shambas. Every time they come to the shamba, you know, and they, you know, they're going through the produce from the farmers and looking at what you have. Most of them will say, hey, hey, customer, the customer will refuse this one. Hey, customer, I make a tar. It is used. I will not be able to sell this because the customer will not be able to take it, which means that the consumers are very powerful. The consumers actually dictate what they're going to have and when they're going to have it and at what price in many, many cases. Though many times, I normally find that um, because our system is a bit broken, so I find that the middlemen are the ones who actually uh, like dictate the price. But many, many times you find that the consumers actually are sovereign and they can actually make the choices on what they want and how they want, which means that we have to be able to think about how we can be able to grow stronger consumer alliances. And um, I don't know whose presentation it was. I think it was for Emmanuel or Martin, where he talks about how the consumers need to be involved. I think it was Emmanuel's uh, presentation, where the consumers need to be involved in making policies and in making decisions and what they're going to be eating. Consumers, you're listening to me, be strong and make the decision about what you're going to eat, how it's going to be grown. And you, are actually, you actually have the power to actually make the choice if your food is going to be safe or not, depending on depending on how you push for what you really want. Uh, the next slide, which is my final slide, you know. So this is my question to you, you know, like, what is your choice? You know, do you know of local farmers? You know, I know many of our customers are very happy to buy from us because they know me. 
you know, they know me, they've come to my shamba, they know what I'm growing, and they're able to access the produce that you grow. But, you know, not many people have got access to a farmer like me. But you can actually try, you know, try and think about your local farmers and ask them, are you growing your food sustainably? And um, ask questions, you know, like, how do you grow your food, you know? Uh, um, um, like, do you spray, you know, the um, synthetic inputs or, you know, what strategies are you using? And, you know, let me give you a challenge. You know, I normally find with many people nowadays, they're even going as far as asking the mamambogas in the market, you know, like, do you know where these vegetables are coming from? When you start asking the mamambogas, they will start asking the farmers and asking them, how do you grow your things? My customers are asking whether you're using, you know, safe products or you're using chemicals that are going to harm our um, um, you know, like I want the nice big leaves, you know, the wonderful tomatoes, the wonderful, uh, you know, nice shaped carrot and everything. But if you're stuck on aesthetics, that means that you're going to be forcing the farmers to actually grow things in a way that's not sustainable. They have to spray more than they need to spray. They have to be able 